Well, uh, thank you, Lisa, for reading so well, particularly those rivers. Well done on pronunciation. It's always tricky when you get the Bible reading. It has the weird words. Uh, my name's Mike. I'm one of the pastors here at church. Uh, we've got lots to cover, so I'm going to pray, and we're going to jump straight in. Let me, let me pray. Heavenly Father, we just ask this morning that you help us to listen to your wisdom as we explore these doctrines. Help us to understand what your Bible says on these important topics of our lives and help us to know your wisdom and your goodness in them, that we might live in light of them to the glory of your name. This we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, our doctrine for the Doctrines of Genesis series today is the doctrine of work. And I'll start with a bit of a story that I heard recently of a man who, after 47 years in his job, so 47 years in the one job, I was 11 years in my one secular job, this guy, 47 years, so a long time. But after 47 years in his one job... And after 47 years of the ear-piercing alarm clock that would jolt him up every morning and remind him when it went off that it's time to get up and it's time to get dressed and it's time again to go to work, who for his final day after his 47-year job took that alarm clock to work, placed it under the 80-ton hydraulic press and squashed it because uh, he was infuriated with his alarm clock. And of course, out of curiosity, I Googled it, because you know how they have those, all those hydraulic things on YouTube videos? Well, I found one, and uh, you won't see the video, but you'll see the before and after. There we go. Uh, squashed alarm clock. But for many, that, that's kind of their view of work, right? Work, for them, is this reality of this burdensome thing they have to do day after day after day. Now, work is this burden that you must suffer until that day you can finally be free of the shackles of work. Uh, or then there's this very different view of work uh, where actually work is incredibly satisfying for some people. And you, know, you, you love your work and actually one of the main purposes of your life is to find uh, the love of your work. And uh, here's Steve Jobs, CEO of uh, Apple, that writes this and uh, he's talking to a bunch of uni students, so they're all naive. But he says this, he says, you've got to find what you love. Uh, and that is as true for your work as it is for your lovers. There's issues there already, but anyway. Uh, your work is going to fill a large part of your life, and the only way to be truly satisfied is to do what you believe is great work, and the only way to do great work is to love what you do. And from that perspective, your job is very important. Not a burden, but really important and really purposeful. And that given that all of us uh, generally will spend about 50% of our waking hours working, and for most of us, for at least 50 years of our life, so 50% of your life, for 50 years of your life, you'll be working, it would be nice to love your job. And so just to kick us off, to get you thinking, what's your view on work? Where do you sit? Are you, are you more down the you know, infuriating alarm clock end of things and, and you know, oh, it's a burden? Or are you more down the worker's lover sort of end of things, the Steve Jobs version? Uh, is it you, you, know, you go to work to earn the money, to buy the food, to gain the energy, to then go to bed, to get up the next day, to get up, to go to work, to earn the money, to buy the food, to gain the energy, to get up and round and round it goes? Or is it I, I'm, I'm going out there in my job to change the world? And I love my job, and it's, it's a great part of who I am, and I love the difference that I make. Uh, I suspect in a room like this, there'll be a whole bunch of different views. Some of you would like your job, love your job, some will hate your job, some of you find it as a burden. Uh, for many of us, I think some days it's, it's all over the place. Some days you get up, and it is the desire to kind of pick up that alarm clock when it makes the noise and throw it across the room and just cry, I don't want to do it today. And at other times, you might joyfully hop in the car and... Off you go, or, or you know, go to the home office and with your tracky dax, of course. Uh, but you see, regardless of your experience and how you feel about your job and this thing that we call work, what does God actually say about work? Uh, how, how does, how does you know, the, the Bible actually teach us about this thing we call work? How do we understand it? Because there's a danger at both extremes, right? We can so love our work that instead of God shaping our work, well, actually our work becomes our God. That's a real danger. But then also on the other end, we can so dread our work that instead of letting God shape our work, that in our work we dishonor our God. So uh, as has been our habit, I want to follow a, a simple structure in the sermon today. Point one will be work in the beginning. So what can we learn from Genesis 1 and 2 and the, the creation account about work? 
Then point two will be uh, work after Genesis 3 because we know that human sin affects everything, including our work. And then finally, point three, work as a Christian. How does being a follower of Jesus transform how we work? But before we kick off, I just want to define a little bit what the Bible means by work. Uh, Because here's our problem as modern Westerners. This is what we do when we say the word work. This is our problem. When we say work, we mean paid work. We mean gainful employment. And that's not how the Bible talks about work overall. Work includes things like domestic work and cooking and cleaning and laundry. If you don't see that as work, it's probably because you've never done it. Uh, You know, mowing the lawn, uh, repairing the house, fixing the car. That's that's work. Uh, Subsistence farming, uh, where you grow your own crops or keep your own livestock to feed yourself and your family. That is work. Uh, Galatians chapter 6 talks about working for the good of all, especially your brothers and sisters in Christ, which means helping your fellow brothers and sisters and and fellow Christians to move house or fix house or paint house or whatever it might be, that's work, as as the Bible defines. Actually, all your good works are work, uh, as is the work that we do in serving God here at this church. That's work, Uh, as is the work of a parent especially the mum with the very young children. Uh, you, you know, when the, when the full-time mum gets asked, oh, what do you do with yourself? And, and the mum kind of says, because you know, this is how our world makes us talk these days, and the mum just says, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm just a mum. That's all I do, I'm just a mum. And at that point, I feel like saying, no, you're a superhero. You're doing one of the most important and most difficult jobs of all the raising of little followers of the Lord Jesus. That is, that is work. Uh, if you don't get that, it's because, like me, you're probably not a young mum. That is work. So keep that in mind as we look at this doctrine of work. A lot of what will be applicable, uh, a lot of what I'll say will be applicable to paid work, but work's far more broader than that. Uh, The Bible says a lot more about about work, not just paid work. Uh, It's all those things I just listed out. But in saying all that, we're up to point one now, work in the beginning. And I don't want to be too long on this point, but just head back to Genesis chapter 2. As you do that, I'm going to adjust this up because somebody's lowered it. So go to Genesis chapter 2 from our Bible reading. There you go. It's a bit better for me. Uh, Genesis chapter 2. And uh, remember the pattern we saw from last week. So last week we did the doctrine of rest, of Sabbath. And remember the pattern from last week. Six days God created. uh, He worked. And in one day he rested. And that, that was the pattern we saw in the Sabbath command as well. So six days you work. And then one day you rest from all your work. Uh, Which is all to say, in that pattern we saw last week, we see that God is a worker. And because as human beings we're created in the image of God, we're image bearers of the God who made us, we also, we're workers. Uh, we, We do different work, but we are workers. And you see that in a few places in Genesis 2 from our Bible reading. So look at verse 5. Have a look at Genesis 2 verse 5. And can you see the problem with verse 5? Let me read it. It says this, says, No shrub of the field had yet grown on the land, and no plant of the field had yet sprouted, for the Lord God had not made it rain on the land, and there was no man to work the ground. And then look at verse 15. You get the same sort of idea in verse 15. The Lord took the man, and he placed him in the Garden of Eden to work it and watch over it. And so in the beginning, God makes man with this responsibility to work. It's part of what we're built to do, to work. Uh, and because male man, uh, as all our sisters will know, is useless on his own, we get verse 18. Look at verse 18. Then the Lord God said, It's not good for the man, the male man, to be alone. I will make a helper as his complement. And so then we get female. Uh, and so we have this picture in the Bible of the necessity for humanity to be rulers and subduers and workers of the creation as male and female. Together, to to work the creation, we need male and female. They're complementary, and we'll think more about that next week. But at this point, what we need to know is that work was there in the beginning. Uh, From the beginning, God entrusted his image bearers as male and female with this responsibility to work. And it was very good. Work's not a result of sin. Work is not a bad thing per se. Work was there in the beginning, and it was very good. But not so after Genesis 3. And so we're up to point 2 now. 
And uh, as we know, sin changes everything. We'll think more about sin in a few weeks' time. But the effects of sin on our work are clear. So just flick now to Genesis 3, the next page, or it might be just the, the page over. Genesis 3, and look from verse 17. And it's really interesting there to note the different curses that are given uh, to the woman and to the man. They're different for the woman and different for the man. Again, we'll think about that uh, more next week. But I want us to see what God says from verse 17. Look at verse 17. So sins entered the world. Things have been broken. Verse 17, God says to Adam, to the man, because you listened to your wife's voice and ate from the tree about which I commanded you, do not eat from it. The ground is cursed because of you. You will eat from it by means of painful labor all the days of your life. It will produce thorns and thistles for you, and you will eat the plants of the field. You will eat bread by the sweat of your brow until you return to the ground since you were taken from it. For you are dust, and you will return to dust. And again, very poetic, Genesis 1, 2, 3, and, and, and again, we talked about that in our first week, so go back and listen to that sermon if you like. But just notice there how many times the word eat comes up, the word eat. Uh, four times in those, just those three verses, the word eat. And so the, the most basic of human necessity, we all need to eat. That's what we need to do. But the, the most basic of our necessities to eat will now become very difficult. A very difficult task for us to be able to eat is what that's telling us. Uh, the ground will produce uh, food but, but is now cursed. So it will be painful labor, verse 17, simply to eat. Uh, you will eat only by the sweat of your brow, verse 19. It will be a hard thing just to put food on the table. And the ground that God made for, for humans to rule over and subdue will no longer submit to humanity, but actually will resist. The, the, the ground will produce thorns and thistles, verse 18. And more frustrating, the ground will swallow you up. So you know, to, to, you're made from dust, and then to dust you'll return. And so the ground now is kind of where you return as, human, as humanity, verse 19. Which is all to say, when sin enters, work, this thing we do, this activity we do, work is frustrated. It's just hard. It's hard. And not only is work itself hard, the doing of the work, but now so are the workers because of human sin. And you've probably noticed in your own jobs and in your own work, people often are the most frustrating part of your work. Sometimes the labor can be hard, but it's the people you have to do it with or the people you have to work under, or the clients, or the customers, or, or the students that make your work very, very hard and frustrating. And so after Genesis 3, everything is different. You, you can now work very, very hard with great purpose to no end. Complete waste of your time. Uh, that tender at work that you, you know, labored for and applied for and then you never get. That student as a teacher that you invest your time in and you love them and you care for them and you prepare for the class and you prepare for this whole class. You spend hours preparing to teach these students and not one of them listened. Uh, that project at home, um, it's Father's Day so I'm sure the dads get these right. That project at home that you spend hours working on with all these dreams that it will work and it never does and you just get frustrated. And you, know, you yell and swear at it, don't swear at it, but you do. Uh, and it all falls apart, right? Works frustrated. And even if you do happen to be successful in your work, well, then death and decay take over. To dust it and you will return. Uh, I was speaking with an architect recently who was involved in the uh, exhibition center in Darling Harbour. I don't know if you remember it, that kind of big old exhibition center in Darling Harbour. He was one of the architects involved in it, this grand structure. It was opened in 1988, kind of great, great applause in 1988, uh, and then demolished in 2013. I think too much applause because it was pretty ugly, if you remember. I didn't say that to this architect guy. <laughs> His life work barely lasts 25 years. That's work. Uh, the writer in Ecclesiastes writes this. He says, For what does a man get for all his work and all his efforts that he labours at under the sun? For all his days are filled with grief and his occupation is sorrowful. Even at night his mind does not rest. This too is futile. You see, that is the reality we're born into as humanity, which is encouraging, isn't it? <laughs> Makes you want to get up and go to work tomorrow. And of course, that's not the whole picture. Praise God, there's point number three to come, so just rest assured. <laughs> but there, 
But I just I want us to pause at this point and just realize that there's actually reassurance for us under point two. There's, real, there's reassurance for us here because there, there's something helpful in understanding that the work we do is toil. There's something helpful, I think, in understanding that the work we do is frustrating and that working is hard and is wearisome and that you're, ex- you're to expect that your work will be hard and wearisome because our modern Western world, what our, what our modern Western world has done is turned work into this idol. They, they've turned work into this fanciful idea that your job must fulfill you. It must. It, it, you know, your only purpose is to work, and so your job must fulfill you, and, and it must satisfy all your needs. And if, if your work is unsatisfying and unfulfilling, then there's something wrong with you. And if you're not satisfied in your work and you find it hard and toilsome, then actually you need to go find the job that you're actually destined to have. Go out there and find it until you find your fulfillment, because you need to be fulfilled in your work. But that whole concept is not only unbiblical but it creates this huge amount of pressure upon people and upon you. Uh, Actually, not only is it elitist, that idea of needing to find fulfillment in your work, because many never get the choice of a job. They just, whatever they can get, they need to earn money. They find what they can. vast majority of our world never gets to choose their job. So it's a fallacy, but also it sets us up to fail, this idea of finding all your fulfillment in your job. It sets you up to fail because your job will never truly satisfy you. It just won't. And even if it does for a small part of your life or for a part of your life, you happen to love your job and you find great fulfillment in it. Well, if you're a Christian, well, then that's a real big problem because then your job has become your God. And that God, as good as it is, you know, maybe in your you know, late 30s, mid 40s, where you're on, on top of whatever your job might be and then the world's great. Uh, but actually that God of, of, of work will, will disappoint you because ultimately in this world of death and decay, work is futile. It does not last and you cannot take it with you. See, part of the reason I think for the high levels of anxiety in our society is due to this pressure about needing to be fulfilled in your work. But that's fanciful. Work is frustrated, the Bible tells us. You don't need to heap that pressure upon yourself when it comes to your job. You're you're free from that pressure if you're a Christian. You don't need to find fulfillment in your job. Which leads me to point three. And I want to move to point three. Work is a Christian. And it's not all doom and gloom, so don't be too depressed yet. Uh, There is great purpose and value in our work. Paid or unpaid, all right? Paid or unpaid, there's great value, there's great purpose. But we've got to be clear on where the purpose and value uh, lies. So I want to share uh, four principles with you uh, on what it means to be a Christian uh, and a worker. Uh, And then I want to go all American on you, and I'll explain what I mean later by that. Uh, So first principle, remember what we learned last week. Jesus offers us rest. Jesus is the one who brings true rest from slavery to sin and from slavery and toil, from the slavery and toil of work. So just to remind you, Matthew 11 from last week, and if you missed that talk, go and listen to it. But Jesus says, come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. All of you take up my yoke and learn from me because I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for yourselves. And I cannot reiterate just how important it is to get this in your head. Because I forget this. I need to keep remembering this over and over again. If Jesus is your Lord and Savior, you have rest, true rest, in Him. Which means, uh, in whatever work you toil at, you do not need to be anxious in your work if you have rest in Christ. You don't need to prove yourself in your job. You don't need to look for satisfaction and acceptance or purpose in your work. If Jesus is your Lord and Savior, there's no kind of career ladder that you have to climb up. There's no greater boss who needs to approve of you. There's no greater goal to achieve, no ultimate rest or retirement to kind of earn for yourself because I've only got this long of my life and retirement needs to be the enjoyment part of life. You don't have to worry about that. You have true rest in Jesus. Again, so much of our identity nowadays is caught up in our work. And so, you know, you get asked, you know, tell me about yourself. I'm a, I'm a teacher. I'm a lawyer. I'm a cleaner. I'm a doctor. I'm a mechanic. But for the Christian, you're free from that. You know, who are you? I'm a Christian. I'm a Christian. 
I'm a highly loved child of God who is fully satisfied in the, in the Lord Jesus who died for me and rose again to give me new life. And that's, that's an identity you can never lose, right? If you lose your job, if you've got your identity in your job, you lose your job, who are you? Or you change your job and nobody knows you anymore. Or you retire from your job and then you're like, oh, what's the purpose of my life now? But in Jesus, you always have rest as a loved child of God. So I just want to ask, this is, particularly if you're a Christian, this is a massively important question. Do you go to work? Will you go to work tomorrow resting in Jesus? Will you go about whatever it is your work? You might be a stay-at-home mum or dad. You might be a full-time worker in a paid capacity. Whatever it is for you, do you go to your work resting in Jesus and satisfied in him? Fulfilled in him? Or are you trying to find your identity in what you do and your approval and your fulfillment? And I just want to say, you don't need to do that. Not only will that fail to work, but you already have full satisfaction in Jesus and approval in him, a child of God. Rest in him. That, that's a principle, number one principle we've got to hold on to as you think about your work. The next principle for uh, work as a Christian is our love for God. Uh, and as a Christian, your ultimate boss, uh, believe it or not, is the Lord, is God. Uh, it's Jesus that we're ultimately serving. And that, that completely transforms what you do in your work and in your workplace. So Colossians 3 says this up on the screen. Whatever you do, including your work, do it enthusiastically as something done for the Lord and not for men knowing that you will receive the reward of an inheritance from the Lord. You serve the Lord Christ. So when you enthusiastically go about your job as something done for the Lord, that pleases God. Uh, and, and the idea of pleasing God, that is highly valuable and highly purposeful. When you work hard and do a good job, God is pleased. If your boss isn't pleased, ultimately it doesn't matter. God is more important to please. That's highly valuable. There's heavenly reward in pleasing your God, is what the Scriptures say. And I don't know if you've ever thought of that, but your, your primary boss is not your employer, but God. Even if you're your own boss, you're still under the boss, God. And God created us to please Him in how we work. And in doing that, that actually glorifies God as well. So I, I really think that Christians should be known as the hard, honest workers. Are you known in your workplace, if you're a Christian, as the hard, honest worker? Because if you are, and, and known as the joyful worker, and not the selfish worker, and not the self-seeking worker, that pleases God, but it also glorifies God. It honors Him. It's part of our purpose as His people, to, to bring Him glory and honor. But that also means, if God is your boss, that you're ultimately accountable to Him. And so, in your job, don't bludge. Don't be lazy. Don't steal time from your employer. I love how Proverbs warns us about laziness up on the screen. It says, go to the ant, O sluggard. I love how Proverbs calls a lazy person a sluggard. Go to the ant, O sluggard, and consider her ways and be wise. Or another proverb, the soul of the sluggard craves and gets nothing, while the soul of the diligent is richly supplied. Um, you see, God knows if you're being lazy and like the sluggard in your work. So don't work only when your boss can see you. Don't work hard only when your co-workers can see you. Uh, don't spend your time on social media or online shopping. Uh, if you work from home, uh, don't confess this right now. Maybe you can confess it to God later. If you work from home, don't send an email every 30 minutes to make it look like you're busy working, Right? <laughs> And in the rest of the time, you're doing whatever, online shopping, looking after kids, whatever it is. Don't do that because you're accountable to God. You work before the, the God who is your boss out of a love for him. So that's principle number two. Work as a Christian uh, is a work out of love for God. Number three, love for neighbor. And this is a really important one because our work should be something we do not to serve ourselves, and our own amb ambitions as Christians, or, or even to make profit for yourself, but actually to serve others. Isn't that backwards? Everything the world tells you about work is, is backwards to that. 
work's about you. But the Christian says, no, the work is about the, the neighbor. The Christian is a person who's transformed to think of others as more important than themselves. Uh, and you see that kind of transformation in the, in the thief of Ephesians chapter 4. So Ephesians 4 on the screen says that the thief uh, must no longer steal. Instead, he must do honest work with his own hands so that he has something to share with anyone in need. And that the idea is there, there was a, a thief who was a thief. He's come to know Jesus. He's become a Christian. So he doesn't steal for himself any, anymore, but he works to serve others. That's the picture. And we serve in all sorts of ways to do that, even in our paid work. Uh, so just an example, a couple of weeks ago, we had a massive uh, electrical problem at church here. Uh, Alex Reed, he's part of our congregation here. He's an electrician. He came in and fixed uh, the electrical problem for our church, uh, charged a, a fair price, a good invoice price. Thank you, brother. Uh, and that, that's an expression of love of neighbor. Because... What Alex did, I can't do. Most of us here can't do. We, we wouldn't have the lights and, and things today if that wasn't fixed. That's an expression of love of neighbor. We needed him to provide a service to do something most of us can't do. And that's, that's true for all our jobs. Uh, plumbers, lawyers, roofers, gardeners, teachers, accountants, panel beaters, mechanics, doctors, nurses, photographers, posties, manufacturers, dance teachers, sporting coaches, IT experts, even politicians and bankers and preachers, right? You know, what we do in our job is an expression of love of neighbor. And when we do it for the good of the neighbor. Because Christians are to love neighbor, are to love others. Which is why there are some jobs that Christians do not do. So Christians shouldn't do things involved with pornography, for example, or sex workers, or gambling, or anything that's designed to take advantage or to hurt the neighbor. Which is why Christians don't rip people off in their jobs, in what they do and what they charge. Uh, I recently heard a story of an apprentice electrician who was told off by his boss because he was working too slow. And his boss was trying to work out, why are, you, why are you working too slow? The other guys work a lot faster than you. They get more work done and so they're making more money for me. Why are you so slow? And he worked out that the apprentice electrician was spending too much time laying neatly the electrical work under the flooring of the house. And the boss just said, nobody can see it. doesn't matter. Just dump it. It's, you know, they won't see it. So just, just do it quickly. Let's move on. But the, the, the apprentice was a Christian, and he politely declined because he said, no, 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 you need to do the job properly. And to leave the electrical wires on the floor, that's, that's a hazard. That's dangerous. And so he politely declined to his boss and found another boss. You see, our work is an expression of love for others. That's point number three. The last principle might surprise you. You work as a Christian to eat. And uh, I find this fascinating because for all our modern talk, uh, for work as a career and to find our identity in, uh, for the vast majority of the world, if you ask them, why do you work? If you're outside you know, our kind of middle, upper class sort of circles, you, why do you work? Dumb question. I work because I need to feed myself. And feed my family. I work because I need to feed my face. That's why I work. And, and to provide for my extended family. Uh, so from our second Bible reading from before, 2 Thessalonians 3, it's up on the screen. Paul says this. He says, If anyone isn't willing to work, he should not eat. For we hear that there are some among you who, are, who walk irresponsibly, not working at all, but interfering with the work of others. Now we command and exhort such people by the Lord Jesus Christ that quietly working they may eat their own food. And partly that comes back to love of neighbor because if you don't work and you're lazy, well then you're depending on other people and bludging off them for, for food and for shelter and for clothing. Uh, and if you are able to work, sometimes there's reasons why we can't work and then we have to support those people. But if you're able to work and you don't, that's not loving. That's selfish. And again, it's really interesting because our modern world makes work all about career and identity. But when the Bible talks explicitly about work, it only talks about food. See, what does the Bible say about work? Work to get food. Uh, it was there in Genesis 1 and 2. You worked in the garden to eat. Uh, it, it was there in the curses. So Genesis 3, the curses are now your eating will be hard work. Uh, 2 Thessalonians 3 up on the screen is about working to eat. Uh, 1 Timothy 5, our next verse, says this, says, but if anyone does not provide, and that means provide the basic necessities for his own, that is his own household, 
He has denied the Christian faith and he's worse than an unbeliever. See, one of the major principles for work is to provide food and clothing and shelter for your household. And I think remembering that as a Christian is really freeing because it's a good thing for you to get up and go to work and toil and labor to provide for your family and to provide for your extended family and to be generous with the things God gives you. That is massively valuable. That is one of the primary purposes for work. So there are our, our four our principles uh, for work as a Christian. But I just want to uh, finish by going all American on you. And what I mean by that is, you know how the Americans like to write books and do sermons like, the 10 things you need to know about work. And they just kind of fire stuff at you. Uh, I'm going to do that, but not 10. I only give you five because I've already gone for half an hour. So I apologize for that. Uh, five quick things because there's so much to talk about with work. But let me throw five uh, quick things at you. Number one is, you are not your job. I just want to keep saying this. You are not your job. God cares far more about who you are and how you work than what your job is. The Bible says nothing about what types of jobs. It doesn't care. God cares about who you are and how you work. And other people should think the same. When they don't, just ignore them. See, our Lord has it backwards. They lift up the, the valuable and the worthwhile uh, by saying they're valuable and they're worthwhile because they earn lots of money and they're wealthy. And usually those people, they earn lots of money and they're wealthy because they've been greedy and they've been wicked. Uh, if you want to talk about the most valuable jobs in our society, can I tell you, probably two of the most valuable jobs in all our society are the garbage collectors and the sewage workers. Because without those things, there's all sorts of disease and sickness. They are massively valuable for our society and we don't even acknowledge them. Our world has it backwards. Don't tie your worth to your job. Forget what the world says. God cares nothing for what your job is unless it's a job that's damaging to, to, to your neighbor. He cares about who you are in Christ. Number one, you are not your job. Number two, beware workaholism. Uh, I've already talked about lazy, uh, laziness, but workaholism is just as unhelpful. And uh, you can be a workaholic for all sorts of reasons, for money, for greed, for status, for pride, a lack of trust in, in God being sovereign, just poor decision-making and just saying yes to too many things, not saying no enough. Uh, for me personally, I need to keep working on this and making sure I fulfill all my responsibilities. You see, God does not say to you, he does not say be the best and greatest worker you can be at your job and work really, really hard at your job and work really long hours and that will honor me, your God. God doesn't say that. No, God says glorify me in everything, which means not just your job. How do you love your parents? How are you loving your spouse, your kids, your friends, your brothers and sisters in Christ? How are you going at serving your church? That's what God says, glorify me in everything. So beware workaholism. Number three, beware escapism. Uh, some people turn to work to escape the problems of their lives. Uh, or even, if they're being honest, to escape their families. And I see this with mums and dads, so I see fathers who uh, use work as an excuse uh, to escape the family responsibilities because, um, you know, let's be honest, sometimes staying back at work or going to a work function is much easier than going home and dealing with the family and the kids. So they use work as an excuse to, uh, to basically uh, forfeit their responsibilities as, as a family man. Or sometimes mums do the same as well. They go back to work early to escape dealing with little kids. Even though they don't need the extra money, they go back to work because they want to escape the kids. We need to be aware of that. We, work is not something that we use to escape from other things. That's looking to work to fulfill us. But it also neglects other responsibilities. Beware of escapism. Number four, two more to go. Your job is not a calling. So sometimes uh, Christian people say to me that they're trying to discern, what's God's calling for my life? I'm trying to work out the job God wants me to do which is often very, again, middle or upper class. So, you know, is God calling me to be a doctor or a lawyer or a teacher or a dentist? It's funny how God's Holy Spirit is very middle class, you know. Christians never come to me and saying, oh, I'm trying to discern if God's calling for my life is to become a truck driver. Nobody has asked me that. But truck drivers, they're hugely important. We need them. So we've got to be careful. God does not call us to a job. Your job is not your calling. You are called... To Christ. 
you're a Christian, you're called to Jesus. Your job is, is not your calling, your Jesusness is your calling. Uh, and so that impacts your job, yes, but it's not who you are, your job. It's not useful to spend your time trying to work out where has God destined me to be. No, where has God put you right now? And then work faithfully where you are right now. And if your job is horrible and it's a toxic workplace, well, it's good to search for another option if you can, try to find something else. But even while you stay in that context, be a faithful worker. Uh, You're before God. God does not call us to jobs. He calls us to Christ. Which brings me to number five. Well done. You've made it. Last one. Uh, remember the work of the Lord. Which is all to say, as Christians, if you're a Christian, we can get so obsessed with our earthly jobs and so obsessed with spending so much time doing those earthly jobs that we neglect the eternal work of sharing Jesus with people. Uh, You see, remember, work is more than just a paid job. If you want to talk about Bible and work, Well, then there's one kind of work that the Bible says is of eternal value. And that is sharing Jesus with people and helping people to grow more like Jesus. That is a work of eternal value like no other work is. And all of us have a job to do that. See, all our paid work will ultimately perish, but people are eternal. And God has put you where you are to do that work of the Lord, of sharing Jesus with people. You're, in your workplace, you can go where no one else can go. I can't go to your workplace because I'm not there. Other people here can't go to your workplace because they're not there. God has put you there to do the work of the Lord. The people in your sphere each and every day are people that God has put there for you to share Jesus with them and share Jesus with them and invite them to things like the life course. Uh, Tell them of that true rest that they can find in Jesus. They don't need to find their purpose in their work. So that's number five. Remember the work of the Lord. It's of eternal importance. Well, I've gone long. I need to pray. Let me pray for us. And if you've got questions, write them down or come find me after. But we need to wrap up. Let me pray. Well, Heavenly Father, we do thank you that you are the God who gives us true rest in Jesus, your Son. Help us not to be people who eat up the the, the language of our world and try to find our purpose in our jobs. And help us to realize our jobs are far broader and richer and our work is far richer than just our paid jobs. That we are to love you, to love neighbor, and to point others to Jesus. Please help us in those most important works to the glory of your name. In Jesus we pray. Amen.